Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor Nielsen, and I'm the Climate Action Outreach Coordinator with the Regional District of Nanaimo. I'd like to wel welcome you to our first webinar of our 2023 Fall Webinar Series. It's actually an out outreach series, but this is the first webinar <laughs> of the series. Um, and this series informs residents about various ways where you can take climate action at home. We're going to be covering topics such as rebates and incentives, processes for enhancing your home energy efficiency, and transitioning to electric vehicles. So before I get any further, I just want to acknowledge that I'm hosting this meeting from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, whose land I'm very fortunate to work and live on. Um, and tonight's webinar is about owning electric vehicles in the regional district of Nanaimo. And I'm joined from Michael Stanier from Plug in BC at the Fraser Basin Council, who's going to be delivering tonight's presentation. So before we get into the EV presentation, I'm just going to kick things off um, with a quick chat about our rebates that we have going on and then um, our upcoming events. And of course, it's not there we go. Okay. So our fall webinar series is part of the RDN's ongoing green building program. Since 2012, this program has been open to all electoral area residents, and it focuses on connecting residents to rebates, incentives, and professional knowledge on designing, building, and renovating green homes. And transportation is currently responsible for about 60% of emissions in the region. So if you drive a car or another um, gas vehicle, transitioning to an electric vehicle is one of the most effective actions you can take to help us reduce emissions in the RDN. If you'd like to find out more about this rebate or any of our other rebates, please visit uh, the link that's at the very bottom of this slide here, www.rdnrebates.ca. So um, one of the rebates that we do have is for installing an electric vehicle charging station, a level two in your home. Um, the RDN rebate is for $150, and this is available to all electoral area residents on a first come first serve basis, um, and it can be stacked with the provincial and federal rebates that are available. So um, luckily for all of us, the BC Hydro, uh, they reopened their Clean BC Go electric EV charging rebate program in October. And under this rebate, you can get up to $350 for the purchase and installation of a level two EV charger and up to $4,000 for buying or leasing a new vehicle. I'm sorry about that. It's just submitting one person. And then there's also a federal government rebate that's uh, available for purchasing a new electric vehicle. And this can be stacked with the clean BC rebate and the federal rebates for $5,000 for the purchase of a vehicle. So we keep our rebate page on the RDN um, that, that link that's on there, the RDN page, we keep that up to date with all the latest information. So if you want to apply for rebates this year or have any questions about our rebate program or want to look into things for next year, just go to the link on that, just go to that webpage there and you can find all the information. Okay. And just um, a little bit more information on our upcoming events that we have for the 2023 Fall Outreach Series. Uh, some of the other events we have coming up include two draft proofing workshops that are going to be held on November 24th in Nanaimo and January 26th in Arrington. And unfortunately, the Nanaimo workshop is currently full, so we do have a wait list going for that event. But if this is something you'd be interested in joining, then you can always sign up for the, Air, uh, the Arrington workshop, which is going to be held at the Bradley Center from 3 to 5 p.m. And then we have another webinar coming up on November 28th at 12 p.m. That's about energy efficient upgrades and sorry, energy efficient upgrades and rebates. And this webinar is going to be co-hosted by the RDN and Clean BC, who's going to be providing us with updated information about all the different rebate programs that are available right now for energy efficient upgrades to your home. And as always, these events are always free and open for registration. So if you go to the link in the top left corner of this slide, um, that's where you can find more information about these uh, events and you can register for the events there. So I'm going to pass this presentation off to Michael and thank you everyone for joining tonight and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Taylor, and uh, good to see you, everyone. I know we have some uh, EV owners uh, online here, um, as well as uh, Hopefully, some some folks who are uh, kind of looking into getting an electric vehicle. Uh, let me just get my shared screen going on here. Get it into PowerPoint and get it launched. No, nope. there we go. 
All right, so my name is Michael Stanier. I work for Plugin BC, and uh, that is uh, a program, a working group at uh, a larger NGO called the Fraser Basin Council that broadly does sustainability work uh, all over the province. Um, a lot of what we do at Plugin BC um, tends to be uh, work on behalf of uh, the province or, or local governments uh, around, around electric vehicles, whether that's um, doing education and outreach or uh, uh, doing you know, rebates around charging stations. We've got uh, a small team um, and uh, one of uh, my coworkers, JM, is uh, also with us tonight. So uh, if anything happens to my connection, um, hopefully JM will be able to keep you entertained uh, until I, I make it back. And the reason I mentioned that is I'm just uh, presenting from a, a hotel room uh, tonight, but it, it seems like so far the connection is okay. Uh, so I mentioned that we've got a few different programs at Plugin BC. Uh, one is the public charger program, and that is for installing a really high powered uh, fast charging stations in underserved areas throughout the province. Uh, that's an application based program. So we don't get to just decide where they go. Uh, people have to apply. Um, we also have EV advisors for multi unit uh, residential buildings and workplaces um, because there are rebates available to get charging stations and um, in into workplaces and uh, into condos and apartments. Uh, we don't process those rebates, but uh, our staff can advise kind of on, on those projects because they are um, very usually long and involved projects. Uh, we do a few different or two different fleet programs. One's called Go Electric Fleets, and that's all about getting uh, charging infrastructure and stations um, for fleet use, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, like at a, at a depot or a, a truck yard. Uh, something like that. Um, and then we also do the uh, uh, go electric rebates for kind of specialty use vehicles, uh, whether that's medium and heavy duty trucks and buses, or uh, cargo e-bikes or uh, scooters, basically everything that's not a regular passenger vehicle. And then um, finally, the program that I work on the most is called Emotive. And that's all about uh, just education and outreach and being a resource for people who um, just want to learn more about driving an electric vehicle and uh, specifically doing that in BC. So what I'm going to be presenting tonight kind of falls under that emotive brand. Um, this is a, uh, a focused uh, EV 101. I have material that can go on for hours and hours to cover all um, of the angles that you can sort of discuss electric vehicles. Uh, but tonight I'm going to do a focus on uh, cost of ownership, uh, that's probably going to be uh, a large portion of, of this presentation, um, as well as, you know, we'll talk about range anxiety, um, charging infrastructure, and then finish off with about a bit about uh, vehicles and technologies, um, just kind of like what's the, what's the newest stuff out there that you should be aware of. Uh, and as I go through at the end of each section, um, we'll just do a quick check-in to see if there's any comments in the chat, and I uh, may take a moment to answer one or two questions, um, but uh, I want to get through all the material. So um, we'll probably save the bulk of the questions for the uh, uh, period after I finish up the presentation. Um, so we get to drive uh, and use uh, and lease uh, a variety of electric vehicles. Um, you know, we started off with a Volkswagen e-Golf that we used for work. Um, we, uh, we've had Chevrolet Bolts, we've had uh, um, you know, some Tesla stuff. Uh, this past summer, we leased uh, one of the new Ford Lightning pickups um, to try that out and to haul our staff and equipment around to events. Um, and uh, you know, we, we've got the receipts and uh, we uh, you know, clearly save money um, driving electric uh, in terms of like the operational costs and just driving them around, for example, um, we we took this uh, pickup from Calgary to to Courtney. Um, that's where I live in Courtney, uh, and the fast charging cost was sixty six dollars and eighty cents, so um, less than the ferry ticket. 
Uh, and we didn't use any free charging stations on this trip. It was all sort of premium fast chargers. Um, so it's definitely in line with uh, what really everyone else experiences is that uh, just running the vehicles around saves a ton of money. Uh, Taylor mentioned the uh, upfront, upfront cost solutions. Um, and I just kind of want to get this out of the way first, because this is sort of the, the driest uh, section that I'll talk about. But um, yeah, if you're buying a, a passenger vehicle, there's two rebates that you can take advantage of. One is the CleanBC Go Electric uh, rebate. Uh, and, and we'll get to another slide where it breaks down those levels, but that's going to be anywhere from uh, $500 to $4,000. Um, and then there's also the uh, Canada IZ Federal one up to $5,000. So um, that's a uh, you know, total of, of $9,000. I also want to mention uh, in BC used passenger vehicles are PST exempt, um, no PST at all on those. And uh, I didn't put it on the slide here, but the um, PST surcharge, uh, you know, commonly referred to as the luxury tax, uh, doesn't kick in on electric vehicles until they cross the seventy-five thousand um, dollar mark, whereas uh, on gas vehicles they that would kick in uh, starting at fifty-five thousand um, dollars. So when you get into the higher end, uh, you know, more expensive trucks, um, big people mover kind of vehicles, then uh, that that comes into play uh, in a big way. Um, and as, as I mentioned, we do uh, out of our office run some programming on uh, the specialty use vehicles, um, you know, $2,000 for small stuff like low speed, kind of little personal vehicles, scooters, that sort of thing, up to $150,000 off of uh, big trucks and buses. And uh, there is a rebate for cargo e-bikes, um, but that is just for uh, fleet use. So you have to be a business um, or other organization uh, to take advantage of the cargo e-bike rebate. Um, like I said, a bit more details on the uh, Clean BC rebate. This one is um, uh, income tested. So you uh, submit, uh, first of all, you, you apply for this one in advance, um, just, you know, through uh, the uh, clean, here, I got the address here. Oh yeah, it's, it's on the screen there, the, uh, the URL to apply for one of the Clean BC uh, Go Electric rebates. Uh, you do that in advance, uh, submit some tax, uh, documents. And uh, then you'll get some um, kind of like a, a voucher for your rebate. And that's good for a year. When you're buying a vehicle, you, uh, you know, you present that uh, to the dealership, or if you're, you're doing it online, um, you, you enter that, and, uh, and you get your rebate. So once you apply for that, you don't have to do other applications or anything. And then the federal one is just point of purchase, uh, you get it automatically as long as the vehicle qualifies. And um, uh, for the most part, if it's a passenger vehicle that uh, that starts at or that goes up to fifty five thousand um, uh, dollars, it, it's it's good for rebates. Um, and then there are other tiers uh, above that for larger vehicles such as trucks and you know three row. Uh, passenger vehicles, uh, that sort of thing. If you go to either the, the Clean BC Go Electric or the Canada uh, ISEV websites, uh, they'll list the vehicles. Um, and uh, when it comes to those thresholds, if a vehicle is, um, you know, $55,000 and it qualifies, then as you add accessories, that's fine. It still qualifies. So if you're adding better you know, roof racks and floor mats and technology packages, then it, it still qualifies. Uh, on the charging station side, um, as Taylor mentioned, uh, there are rebates for both single family homes. Uh, there was some, uh, some changes very recently in October. Um, so now the single family home rebate also includes row houses and duplexes. Um, it's uh, up to $350 or 50% of the cost. Uh, that generally covers about half of the cost of a home charging station. Um, but now another new change is you can get an additional $250 uh, if it's a smart charger, which basically just means that it is um, 
you know, it'll connect to, to Wi-Fi, uh, be able to collect information. Um, it's, uh, and can kind of be involved in some, some power management that way. Uh, and then uh, there is another stream for people living in um, condo buildings. Uh, it's much more complicated and I'm just really going <laughs> to touch on the surface of it here. But uh, there's up to $3,000 for having an EV ready plan done. Um, that is, you know, you'll have uh, usually an engineering firm or a dedicated EV installer kind of come into the building and develop um, uh, a, sort of a, a comprehensive plan, usually a plan to get all of the uh, stalls in the parkade or the parking area electrified. Uh, you move on to EV ready infrastructure rebates. So infrastructure is, you know, everything except for the chargers themselves. So that's, you know, panels, conduit, um, all, all the wiring, junction boxes, that sort of thing. Uh, and then finally you can move on to the, uh, the EV chargers, um, and, uh, get up to, to $14,000 there. Or in some cases, uh, people have, suitable chargers that came with the vehicle. And depending on how you've set up your electrical system, they might just be able to, to plug those in. Uh, we do have our EV advisors who can talk to you uh, in much more detail about that. And the email is there on the screen, uh, evadvisor at pluginbc.ca. Yeah, sorry to interject one second, Michael. I just wanted to also add that townhomes are now um, uh, considered MERBs. They weren't before. Uh, so that's a really important feature that just came into play as of October 31st of this year. Um, so townhomes did not used to qualify for the MERB incentive program, and now they do. Yeah, yeah. So I think the, the idea there is that if you're in a situation where you have a lot of control over your parking space um, and you're in some sort of attached housing, then you can just go ahead and take advantage of those much simpler um, uh, rebates. And I think this is as good a spot as any to just kind of really briefly talk about um, getting a, uh, a single family home charging station. Uh, I want to mention, we'll go over some of the terminology later in the presentation, but every vehicle uh, comes with what we call a basic level one charging cable. You just plug that into a regular wall socket. Um, and some vehicles come with uh, uh, a little bit of a beefed up um, charging cable. Uh, that is 30 amp. Uh, usually it's like an RV plug uh, kind of cable. Um, GM and Ford are doing this and it's a, an optional Tesla thing you can get. And I imagine a lot of more other brands are going to start including sort of a basic, what we call level two charging station. Um, but then if you want more power, uh, you can go out and, uh, and buy a dedicated home charging station um, that's going to be usually 30 amps or more. And uh, so that will require, um, you know, new wiring for a 240 volt uh, plug-in um, or just having that directly connected. Uh, though your home, you know, it may already have something like that. If, if you have an RV plug, if you have a, a 240 volt welder or a, a space heater plug, um, so you can get all sorts of, you know, adapters to, you uh, uh, plug a, a charging station into those. Um, and then, uh, you know, JM went through this process. There's some newer products that are kind of like smart switches uh, that will, will allow you to essentially share a plug-in with something on essential, such as a dryer, you know, and, you know, the dryer comes on, turns off your charging station, dryer finishes, charging station turns back on, that sort of thing to help kind of accommodate these power needs. Uh, but uh, let's let's get into um, kind of the the cost benefits of the vehicles themselves here. Trying to stay on track a bit, and uh, because I'm presenting from a hotel room, you're going to hear me flipping through my notes on the side here. So sorry if you can hear paper rustling around. Um, but uh, uh, electric vehicles, um, they uh, they typically cost about two to three dollars per hundred kilometers of driving. Uh, using residential um, electricity rates. You'll pay more for the premium service of uh, high-speed fast charging at one of the like, big high-speed units like Tesla superchargers or the big BC hydro chargers uh, that you see around the community, um, but it's still really cost-effective. And uh, in terms of maintenance, 
Um, there's really not a lot to maintain in an electric vehicle. Uh, it just gets rid of so many components that would be normally found in an engine um, and, uh, and a, a, a drivetrain uh, that includes like a transmission and a, you know all wheel drive, um, drive shaft, all that sort of stuff. So you really get rid of all these components. Um, you know, we had our, our e-golf for work for like three years and uh, we didn't have to do any maintenance on it. Um, we put uh, 15,000 kilometers on the Ford Lightning in just a few months this summer. Uh, didn't need any, any maintenance at all. So, um, you know, it's really our experience as well that there's very little that goes wrong. There's just very few moving parts that have to be maintained. Um, and so there's, there's, I also want to mention, there's this kind of idea uh, that um, EVs are most effective um, doing small distances and doing city driving. Uh, but what we see in practice is that they're most effective for people who have really long uh, commutes. Uh, and this is people who, you know, commute from, uh, Squamish to Whistler, or, you know, commute from the, the Fraser Valley, uh, you know, into, into Metro Vancouver, uh, or are, you know, running down, up and down the Malahat um, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, people in, in Northern BC who work at a sawmill that's 100 kilometers out of town and are, you know, crushing 200 kilometers or more every day, um, those people benefit tremendously from electric vehicles. Uh, really, the, the more that you're driving, the, the bigger the cost savings uh, that you're going to see. There's a lot going on in this slide. This is a, a screenshot from a video that we have, and it was produced uh, a couple years ago. Um, so when we get to the gas uh, expense, you might find it refreshingly low. Um, but uh, this is a, a video called the uh, Dollars and, and Cents of Electric Vehicles. Um, you can see it on the Emotive uh, YouTube channel. But I want to walk you through the comparison that's being done here. Um, you can kind of plug in your own, own numbers uh, if you have a copy of this recording or, or go see that video and you can pause it on the screen and plug that in. Um, but what we're doing here is comparing uh, a gas model and an EV model. Uh, or version of the same model. Um, in this case, it is a, a Hyundai Kona that comes in both gas and electric. Uh, so we start off uh, with the average um, that people drive uh, in a year in BC, which is uh, just under 12,900 kilometers. Of course, some people drive a lot more, you know, like us, I, we put on 15,000 kilometers in, in half the year. Um, but anyways, take that amount, divide it by 100 because our fuel, um, uh, our fuel efficiency in Canada uh, is always uh, a function of units per 100 kilometers, and then multiply that by uh, um, by the uh, uh, the average fuel economy. So on the gas, uh, the gas, the third number down is 7.84. That's representing 7.84 liters per 100 kilometers. On the EV side, it's 16.87. That's uh, kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. And, and we'll be talking about kilowatt hours uh, um, a few times throughout this presentation. It's, it's the, the unit of storage um, of electricity uh, when we talk about uh, electric vehicle batteries. So that all works out to, in a year, driving the exact same um, distance. The gas vehicle would use just over 1,000 liters of fuel and the EV would use 2,175 kilowatt hours. Now, and you may say, well, it looks like the EV is using a lot more fuel, right? 2,175 versus just over 1,000 liters of gas. Um, and this is where EV efficiency comes into play. Uh, that 1,000 liters of gas represents almost 9,000 kilowatt hours uh, of electricity. Um, gasoline is very energy dense, but engines, 
just burn. It's just it's just a physical impossibility to capture much more than twenty percent of that energy when gasoline is burned. So in a gasoline vehicle, for every dollar of fuel that you're using, you're really only getting about 20% of actual work out of that. And the rest is just kind of burned off as um, heat and friction and, and waste. Uh, so just to put those, um, those numbers into, into a bit of context. So anyways, we take our, the, the number or the amount of uh, fuel that we're using in the year, then we multiply it, multiply it by the, the price of the fuel. Again, this was done a couple of years ago. So the average price of gas then was $1.56 a liter. And uh, the uh, 11.7 cents per kilowatt hour of elect electricity is uh, the average of um, the residential electricity rates. And you can see that in a year that comes out to uh, $1,576 uh, for the gas vehicle and $255 uh, for the uh, electric vehicle. Um, and then the, the numbers at the bottom um, are uh, a vehicle lifespan of uh, 250,000 kilometers. Um, so you might, you know, even, even if electricity doubled, for example, um, you'd still be, still be paying quite a lot less. So I know there's, there's a lot going on in that screen, but uh, I just wanted to give you a really detailed kind of breakdown of how you might project um, cost savings. And if you're, you're really getting to the point where you're crunching numbers on an electric vehicle, um, these are the sorts of things that you'd want to track and that you'd want to look up um, how much, you know, what is your fuel economy over at least a few months, if, if not the year, and how much do you actually drive in a year and uh, try and ballpark, uh, you know, average of what you're paying for fuel. And if you're, if you're looking for um, averages, just comparing uh, a variety of vehicles, uh, Natural Resources Canada or Enercan has a really great uh, fuel consumption search rating tool. But uh, I know there's a lot going on there, so uh, I'll move on to some other topics. Um, aside from the, the uh, you know, operational benefits of electric vehicles, um, they are, in some cases, in some cases, uh, <laughs> substantially more expensive than what you might buy um, in a in a gas vehicle, um, and in some cases, uh, not that much more. Uh, and I'll get into some examples. But there's uh, a lot of action um, with automakers uh, adopting both high tech solutions and some low tech solutions to bring costs down. And I just want to bring this up because you're going to hear this terminology as you shop for electric vehicles. Um, a big, you know, literally big uh, deal is what we call gigapress manufacturing. And that's where huge components of the vehicle, of the frame, the chassis and the body are now being made using massive die casting presses. And what this does is it reduces, um, uh, you know, areas of the vehicle that might be made up of like a hundred parts that are welded together down to a single part that's made in one minute or one or two minutes instead of two or three hours. Uh, so vehicles can be made faster and with uh, um, you know, much, uh, much fewer um, welds, much fewer you know, kind of points of failure and, uh, and they're cheaper, cheaper and lighter. Um, another thing uh, that comes up is structural batteries. Uh, a battery, a battery module sits along the bottom of the vehicle and it's just a huge piece of you know, reinforced metal with batteries inside. It provides a lot of structural rigidity. And so automakers are now saying, OK, this, we don't need to build the vehicle's floor and then attach this to it. We just make this into part of the frame. And again, that makes the cars lighter, better range, and reduces uh, parts. Something that you'll probably hear a lot is what's called LFP batteries and some other battery chemistries. Um, uh, LFP is. Uh, lithium iron phosphate um, and it gets rid of uh, cobalt uh, and nickel um, and uh, you know when batteries first were started to come out for electric vehicles um, these lithium nickel cobalt batteries are just what existed 
Um, you know, they go back to Sony Discmans, Sony Handycams, right? That's what the industry knew how to make. Um, and now they've discovered, well, you can replace the cobalt and the nickel with much cheaper iron um, and other components, even getting rid of lithium and using sodium instead uh, that are just, they're somewhat lower performance, but they're far, far um, cheaper uh, much more available. So you'll see some of these battery chemistry, um, uh, you know, discussions come up. Um, even, even if you're looking at vehicles and they might, you know, they might, uh, overtly advertise that it has an LFP battery. That's, uh, um, you know, the, the deal with that. Uh, and then, um, automakers move towards, uh, in-house software and components and Ford is kind of, uh, you know, sort of famous for saying this now is that um, one of the biggest or one of the big barriers that they've faced is that uh, if they want to change something, do a software update to one of their vehicles, they have to deal with the fact that their components are made by hundreds of different companies and they have all these switches and relays and stuff that um, might all be, you know, written by different programmers. Uh, and so it's a, so it's a real ordeal to just change something. Um, so whereas um, some of the new startups like, like Tesla or, or maybe Polestar, some of these newer brands, they do a lot more things in-house and they can make changes faster. They can do updates faster and, and it makes things uh, kind of more cheaper. Uh, and then I've got some low-tech solutions there. The image that you see um, is from a new Volvo vehicle. Uh, it's called the EX30 and it's going to be out um, right by next year. Uh, and the reason that I chose it is um, interiors of vehicles have become fairly elaborate <laughs> over the past couple of decades. Uh, for this vehicle, Volvo made it so that there are virtually no electronics in the doors. Uh, there's no speakers in the doors. There's no uh, ambient lighting. There's no switches. It's just a door handle. Uh, everything is consolidated into the uh, center console um, or done through the touchscreen. And so that makes those components a lot um, a lot easier to assemble, um, a lot cheaper. And in the event of, uh, of a collision, um, you know, you're just re replacing some metal and some recycled plastic, um, not all these cameras and, and lights and, uh, and relays and switches and stuff. And so that's something... Um, you know, te Tesla has also uh, been doing this to some extent too, um, and I think you'll see it in a lot of automakers um, kind of consolidating the electronics and the controls and the switches, um, not so much on the ceiling and the doors and, and kind of putting them in one place so that uh, um, it's easier to assemble and less likely to be damaged. I wanted to throw some numbers out there uh, because I was reflecting on um, you know, when I first started this work, uh, I was dealing with vehicles uh, from 2017. First vehicle I drove was a Tesla Model S 90D. It was a $120,000 vehicle. I was hooked. I thought it was great. I obviously wasn't going to buy it. Um, mm -hmm. But back then it had 478 kilometers of range. Now a, uh, a Tesla Model S is $100,000. And offers substantially more range. So we see this kind of throughout a lot of electric vehicles is that despite inflation, um, those kind of original models that have been around for a few years um, uh, have persistently come down in price while offering more range. Uh, we see that with the Chevrolet Bolt as well, coming down a few thousand dollars and adding more range and uh, the Model 3 being really the most popular electric vehicle out there um, just recently with some price changes is, uh, is now less money than when it was first launched um, and uh, uh, a bunch more range too, as well as just tons of other um, upgrades that have been done over the past few years. And because I had this uh, F-150 Lightning um, uh, that we leased during the summer, uh, and I'd take it to shows and I'd tell people um, how much the sticker price was. You know, we didn't buy it, but I saw the uh, um, the price on the uh, the leasing documents, 
And some people would say, gosh, that's a lot of money. And some people would say, oh, that's about what I paid for my truck because trucks are just pretty expensive now um, if you go out and buy something new. And so I went on to, I spent hours to try and figure this out on the uh, Ford vehicle configure configuration tool. Um, but uh, if you take, uh, you know, an F-150 XLT, it can start at, I think, $49,000, but that's for a regular cab, two-wheel drive, no option. Um, and you really don't see many of those around. Uh, if you option it out to the same spec as the electric version, um, it comes out to uh, about the same. Um, and then uh, and it comes out to about the same before rebates. Uh, if you want to really make it a, a close equivalent to the Lightning, with all the, the plugins and the bed and stuff like that, it has to get a battery, it has to become a hybrid, and then it's a lot more. So um, it's very telling in that, you know, optioning out a vehicle gets really expensive. Um, and, I, and kind of part of the reason why electric vehicles, uh, you know, do have a premium price is because they tend to be packed with a lot of options, um, even in their most basic form. Uh, so that doesn't make them cheaper or more accessible, but I just wanted to point out that when we do comparisons of say a base model gas vehicle to a base model electric vehicle, the EV option or is often optioned out with a lot more tech and a lot more features um, and is kind of more of a premium thing. It makes it difficult to do real like apples to apples comparisons, but there's usually quite a lot of value built into the electric vehicles. Uh, and I, I just, I had to insert this slide because I came across it today. Um, if you're really in the market, you know that comparing things on price alone um, might be a bit naive because uh, financing rates can just be all over the place, depending on what promotions uh, an automaker is running. Um, so I just want to throw this out there. Uh, a lot of the time, you might not have much control over what financing rates are for specific vehicles, but you can talk to your bank, talk to your credit union, and not necessarily uh, just go with uh, whatever the dealership is, is offering or, or the OEM is offering. I want to dip into talking about used electric vehicles as well. Um, uh, we're at the point now where the, the used market is getting pretty good in BC. Um, a lot of vehicles that were initially on their three-year leases, uh, those have ended. So they're in the market. Um, those, uh, you know, sort of like owing uh, a rebate uh, if they were sold too soon, um, those have the reba rebates built in now. And um, the decreasing price of, of new models is pushing the used prices downwards. And then uh, I already talked about used vehicles being PST exempt in BC. And just a quick kind of scan from some used marketplaces, I wanted to throw out some prices of things that I've seen fairly consistently. So that uh, Tesla Model S 90D that I fell in love with back in the day, sorry, my timer, um, that's about you know, $45,000, $50,000 right now. You'd want to see probably about 430 kilometers of range still on one of those. The uh, you know, the ubiquitous Model 3 Teslas um, in the $35,000 to $40,000 range. Uh, Hyundai Konas, you'll see a lot of those on the road in BC. I see those about $35,000. And then the Chevrolet Bolts, um, even a bit cheaper. So, uh, and these are vehicles that are, you know, you know five, five-ish years, years old now, um, for the most part. Uh, so there's still a lot of value in those vehicles and they'll all still be on their warranties. And then, uh, you know, when we talk about um, batteries, I know people really like to talk about batteries and will they have to be replaced. Um, it's super, super rare to actually have to replace uh, a battery. Um, certain early models like the Nissan Leafs, et cetera, uh, they didn't have a lot of battery management. Um, they didn't have much cooling and there sort of became this bad rap around batteries. Now everything has uh, really sophisticated battery management so that they don't overheat. They don't get abused when you're charging them. 
Um, and uh, all electric vehicles have at least an eight year warranty or 160,000 kilometer uh, warranty. And that's on the, the battery and the motors. Um, service and, and repairs, uh, aside from dealerships, you can have service and repairs um, done at increasing um, a variety of independent auto shops too. And there are made in BC uh, training courses for auto technicians. Um, those are done right now out of BCIT, Camosun College, and uh, College of New Caledonia. Uh, that one's up in uh, Prince George. There is a, um, a new uh, program um, uh, run through uh, uh, EV Friendly, it's called, and uh, they they do some certification for what we call aftermarket um, services. So that's everything kind of like outside of the original dealership. That's uh, garages, auto recyclers, tow trucks, uh, all sorts of various services uh, that are automotive that you may encounter. Um, so EV friendly is, is some training for um, those service providers uh, just around, you know, how to work with electric vehicles and uh, EV friendly. Uh, I know they're working on a database of those. Uh, I'm not sure if it's on their website right now, um, but something to look out for as well. And uh, not a um, not a cost benefit, but the uh, HOV access uh, sticker, especially if you're taking the ferry over um, and then getting uh, getting out through Metro Vancouver, um, still quite helpful. Uh, you can uh, apply for those through the uh, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. Okay, um, I know we've got about 20 minutes left, so I could um, blast through a few slides here about the uh, charging infrastructure in BC. Um, just wanted to check in and see if there's any uh, any question around cost. Taylor? There was a question in the chat box from Larry. Um, it's about the ISEV program, the, the, I believe it's the federal program that they used to offer $5,000 per charger. Now Clean BC only offers $2,000 per charger. Is the ISEV program still available for chargers that you know of? The, Is that what it's oh, called? okay. Um, the federal one, uh, and sorry, is this for, um, charging stations and condo buildings? I think, I think that, yeah, I see Larry, Larry nodding. Um, JM, do you have any info on that? Yeah. So, so the, the, um, for, for a temporary time when, um, the BC funding wasn't available, it was coming off the, um, the federal program through NRCAN. And there was only the standalone charging rebate that was available for that, um, which increased the amounts um, for the the number of like stalls or chargers that you're getting um, to five thousand. And yes, it has dropped back down to the original amount, which is two thousand at the provincial level. So there there is no longer any um, federal funding kind of boost that that was put onto that one rebate. Um, but the good news is that the EV Ready um, program is back in effect and um, fully uh, will be fully compensated as it was before. And as I mentioned, the townhomes are now eligible as well. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, those uh, those programs have moved around a little bit lately. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you can... Uh, you can email JM at uh, evadvisor pluginbc.ca. Um, I'm going to uh, just get into a little bit more of, uh, of the content here, uh, talking about um, range anxiety, but mostly charging infrastructure. Oops, get back into my slides. There we go. Um, most, most electric vehicles now have a range somewhere between 300 and, and 600 kilometers. And uh, um, you know, you'll see people driving EVs all over the province. Uh, and we're kind of moving into a space um, where we're, we're not so much concerned over range anxiety as uh, charging convenience and finding the fastest 
um, chargers and uh, and uh, hoping that there's um, you know plentiful charging available on our trip. Um, and the and DC fast charging has become very very quick now compared to when I first started doing this work. One of the most important things uh, I tell people to do if they're concerned about range. Um, and the, I find this super useful because I drive a lot of just various rental vehicles um, or car share vehicles is use the vehicles onboard navigation and tell it what you're trying to do. Uh, and uh, virtually all automakers um, have navigation that will uh, show you where you might need to charge and how long you'll spend charging um, and it's all updated in real time as you drive. Uh, so in the, the pictures that I've got there uh, on the left, it's from a Mustang Mach-E, um, the, the dash showing that I have um, 115 kilometers of range left that I can drive and the charging station's only 15 kilometers away. Um, the picture on the right, uh, it may be a bit more difficult to tell what's going on. This is um, uh, one of the screens that Tesla vehicles will give you uh, where it has a graph of how your battery uh, percentage is gonna drop as you drive the way the vehicle predicts it. And then it overlays it with um, another graph as to how things are actually going for you. And so you can see that if you're a bit heavy on the accelerator, you might wanna back off or you know if there's something something going wrong that you'll need to alter your trip. Um, and just, just an idea of the ranges of some of the um, popular EVs out there um, on the, the really kind of ubiquitous end, the Kona Electric at 415 and the basic uh, Tesla Model 3 at 438 kilometers. Getting into upper range stuff, there's the new Hyundai Ionic 6 at 581 kilometers and uh, the, the Model S kind of flagship, usually the thing that everyone's trying to compare themselves to in the high end um, at uh, uh, over 650 kilometers of range. Uh, this is a fairly current um, snapshot of fast charging stations in the province. So it doesn't include uh, lower powered charging stations. This is all stuff that you'd use high speed on a road trip. You can see there's some spaces to fill in. Um, kind of on, on communities uh, a bit on, on the west side of Vancouver Island and then uh, you know Highway 20 that goes out from Williams Lake uh, to, to Bella Coola um, and then getting into uh, Northern BC. There actually have been a, a couple uh, charging stations that were recently added, but those are our high priorities now for um, BC Hydro and for our own uh, funding program for, for fast charging stations. And uh, when we're talking about these different charging stations, I've mentioned various levels, level one, level two. Um, level one is these uh, cables that usually come with a vehicle, plug into a regular outlet. Um, it's, uh, it's the slowest method, but it's still adequate for a lot of the driving that I've done. Um, usually getting about eight to 10 kilometers of driving range per hour of charging. If you're only driving you know, 50 kilometers in your normal route, you can do this at home and then hit a fast charging in the community uh, as, as necessary. Um, what we call level two chargers are uh, 240 volt power, um, still AC chargers. And uh, uh, it's a bit more common for automakers to include these with their vehicles. Um, these all use something called the, uh, the J1772 plug, which rolls right off the tongue, uh, or, or alternatively, the J plug. Um, the only exception would be Tesla vehicles uh, that have their own plug. And um, you know, there, there is a development where a lot of automakers are moving towards the, uh, the Tesla plug, or it's going to be renamed the uh, um, North American Charging Standard plug. Uh, but those are um, you know, made compatible with fairly inexpensive adapters. Just some examples of these level two stations either uh, mounted on the wall or on a standalone pedestal. And uh, whether it's level one or level two, like I said, it's it's all the same plug. Uh, these two examples, the cord is thicker on the uh, higher powered level two station versus level one, but uh, um, it's the same plug regardless. 
getting briefly into fast charging then. So fast charging is using DC power. Um, you know, we're moving from 240 volt up to, uh, you know, 400, 800, 900 volts. Uh, so this is um, pretty heavy duty uh, equipment that, uh, you know, you'd never have at your own home. Um, it's more of in, in rest areas, gas stations, that sort of thing. Uh, there's two, two standards for plugs out there, CHAdeMO and CCS. So that's why a lot of these stations, you'll come up to them and they have, they have two cables. So it's one for each of those standards. Um, CCS has been the most common uh, in, in the past, say, five years. Um, CHAdeMO plugs exist on uh, um, some uh, Japanese models, uh, but they now have, have uh, switched over to CCS. Um, but anyways, uh, something that, um, that is important to know is that if you're looking at plug-in hybrids, most of them will not have a fast charging plug and they aren't capable of fast charging at these big DC charging stations. Um, and uh, whereas charging at your home would be measured in somewhere from one kilowatt output to uh, maybe up to 11 kilowatts on really high end stuff. Uh, these are 25 on really slow fast chargers uh, up to 350 kilowatts. So huge uh, amounts of power compared to what you'd be doing at home. Those are the, the two different plugs, CCS on the left and uh, CHAdeMO on the right. Um, I know we're a bit pressed for time, so I'm get, not going to go into details about uh, more different types of charging stations, except to mention that, um, you know, the Tesla superchargers that are very recognizable for the sort of hollowed out middle um, white and red charging stations, uh, these are the equivalent of uh, uh, DC fast chargers for other brands. Um, and then Tesla also has their uh, characteristic sleek looking, um, what we call destination chargers that would be the equivalent of level two stations. And they're just like mounted on the wall and, and pedestals. Um, Tesla drivers can get a little adapter to use all the other brands of uh, charging stations, um, but not the other way around. Only Tesla vehicles can use Tesla charging stations for now. 2024, that's going to change and, and virtually every other automaker is going to switch to the, uh, the Tesla style plug. And then there will also be adapters so that the, um, uh, the vehicles from 2023 and older um, will be able to use the, the Tesla style plugs as well. Um, and uh, no, there's a lot going on in this slide. You may want to uh, refer to it later if you get the recording, but it just kind of summarizes all those different um, charging station types, the plugs, the adapters, kind of the, the power levels. Um, like I mentioned, Tesla is, is changing a bunch of stuff so that uh, other brands will be able to use their stations. They have, they have uh, you know, trialed this thing called Magic Dock, which is, um, they have sort of an, an adapter for CCS vehicles built into their charging station. Um, but I, the more eloquent solution that I think will be more common is just that vehicles will have that Tesla style connection. And uh, just um, uh, I wanted to show you uh, very briefly this example of some of the stations that you would encounter uh, in Nanaimo. Um, up at Canadian Tire, there's uh, a brand called Electrify Canada. They have this neat little sort of canopy over the stations. Um, those stations range from 50 kilowatts up to 350 kilowatts. Of course, more power means you charge faster, um, so long as your vehicle can, uh, can request that much. And uh, the, the rate for those or the fee is from 27 cents a minute to 57 cents a minute. Um, I'm typically, if I use those, I'm typically there for about 10 or 12 minutes. So, you know, it might seem like a steep price per minute. Um, you're only there for a few minutes. Uh, the Tesla superchargers down at the uh, Country Club Mall, um, they have switched over to pricing per kilowatt hour. So pricing per unit of, of energy um, instead of time. 
Uh, those go up to 250 kilowatt, like most stations do, or most superchargers do, and uh, 47 cents per kilowatt hour. For reference, uh, a Model 3, um, basic Model 3, I think has a, a 56 kilowatt hour battery. Um, and then the uh, the BC Hydro one down, uh, I think is underneath the, uh, 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 the museum parkade. Um, it's just 50 kilowatts, so it's, it's a little bit older. It's, it's still what we call a fast charger, and um, uh, it's a little bit lower rate, 21 cents per minute. Um, a lot of stations are, are activated just using uh, an RFID card like that to tap and start the session. Um, or in the case of Tesla and probably a lot of the other brands, once this kicks in, all you do is plug the vehicle in and uh, all that activation information, your account for payment is stored on the vehicle and it just communicates that to the station. Um, I know I've been talking quite a lot here. Just wanted to give you uh, an idea of the infrastructure out there. Um, and uh, I wanted to take a few moments now to, uh, to answer some questions. So um, Taylor, do you wanna pick some out for me? Yeah, there is a question in the chat. Um... It says, can you confirm whether using a level two or three charger reduces the longevity of, of batteries? Um, there's been a lot of studies around this. Uh, <clears throat> and um, in the early days, when vehicles didn't have a lot of batter battery management, uh, it could have an effect. Basically, batteries don't like to be heated up uh, to extreme levels. Um, and so some of those early vehicles didn't really have much in the way of managing heat. Now, if you plug into a fast charger, you're going to, you're going to hear all these fans and, you know, compressors and stuff. You're going to hear gurgling from your battery pack as the, um, cooling fluid flows through it. Uh, and it's managed a lot more. So the research from newer vehicles, basically from kind of like that 2017 point onwards, is that it doesn't have a big effect because the vehicle will manage um, and it will just throttle itself down a bit in terms of charging instead of allowing itself to be damaged. Um, batteries still degrade a little bit uh, from the research that I've seen. And this research is based on thousands of vehicles that have um, uh, uh, basically um, information collection devices on their diagnostic ports and they just send it all to a, a research uh, or a, a fleet tracking company. Um, what happens is they'll usually lose about 2% of their battery capacity every year for the first around 10 or first five years because most of them will degrade to about 90% of their original capacity and then they'll just they'll stop. It's kind of like a, a, a breaking in period in a way or a breaking in um, kind of behavior. Uh, and then they don't really degrade after that for the most part, unless like something happens to a, a few of the cells in a module. Um, and that's really regardless of fast charging just because it's managed now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Then there's another question in the chat here. And well, actually I just want to say Larry's comment um, above the question here. It says that many non-EV owners don't see where the charge stations are due to lack of signage. So they feel that there's a lack of infrastructure. That's a great comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's very true. That's why, why we do what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Brian's asking, um, used slash older EV sounds like they become less desirable due to the expended uh, battery life. Or expected battery life, excuse me. Do you see any adjustments here to extend vehicle use or quick battery change outs for older EVs? Um, there, there definitely are some companies that do uh, um, like battery maintenance uh, um, because a, a, a whole battery pack doesn't need to be changed if it's been degraded. Uh, batteries are made up of uh, a bunch of cells that kind of kind of look like double A batteries, um, a bit a bit fatter, some of them, but uh, it's a bunch of cells that go into a bunch of modules that go into the overall pack, and uh, and they can test and and replace uh, some of those components um, depending on the battery. And there's a huge market for um, for used batteries from vehicles that have 
you know, been, been, totaled off in an accident, but you still have basically a perfect battery. And yeah, there are shops that, that will do that work. Um, but uh, in turn, I, I think there's, there's this perception that the batteries are degraded quickly, but if you're going out and buying like a, a Bolt or a, a Kona, um, they went through a recall process that there was a uh, manufacturing defect in the battery and they all had to be replaced, uh, you know, no cost to, to the owner. Um, those are a total steal uh, on the used market because um, a lot of them do have brand new batteries. And if you're buying from, uh, you know, directly from the owner or from uh, a dedicated shop that, um, that deals in used electric vehicles, of which there are uh, on Vancouver Island, uh, they'll be able to tell you if the battery has been replaced. Um, again, there's some like really old vehicles that suffer a lot of degradation, but again, because of that battery management and the newer stuff that's kind of from the past five years, you don't see a lot, a lot of battery degradation. Can I just add something real quick on this? Um, so my first EV was a, a BMW i3 first year that it came out in 2014. And really the main difference is from the newer models is is the range because um, even when I got it, it was less than 120 kilometer range. Um, and it's still running. I was actually driving it today and it's um, probably lost less than 10% of the original um, the battery. So the battery life is, you know, it proven to, to be, have the longevity. Um, and you don't need to replace that that battery um, over time, as, as a lot of people expected when they were first coming out. So that's just as an example. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to say I just I I don't want to cut anybody off that has any last minute questions. So does anybody want to unmute themselves and maybe ask one more question or one more question in the chat here before we close out tonight? Um, there was no more in I... the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hi, sorry about that, Taylor. It's Larry Bolt here. I'm president of the Mid-Island Electric Vehicle Association, and I just wanted to throw a plug out there. We have on the 25th uh, on the Unitarian Hall, 595 uh, uh, Townsite Road. We're having a, a, a day to meet owners and uh, answer any questions people have about EVs. So throw that out there. You can check it. Find it on our website, islandev.org. Thank you. I'm actually going to send out a follow-up email after um, probably tomorrow at this point with the um, the recording link and um, a couple of the other links that we've gone over tonight. Um, so I will include that in the email that I'm sending out to everybody. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you for joining the EV tonight. Do you have any closing comments, Michael? <laughs> um, sure. I, you know, just following up on, on what Larry said, it's uh it is really, really helpful to talk to EV uh, drivers in your community. Um, a lot of my work is done uh, speaking to people who, um, you know, maybe uh, seeing news stories from, uh, you know, Europe or, or the States or something like that, um, getting perspectives on, on electric vehicles uh, and, um, you know, sort of navigating this space where, you know, they, they've heard that there's something really uh, that sounds like a big barrier to driving electric vehicles, and yet a bunch of their friends and coworkers have them, and they're trying to like navigate that space of finding out, you know, what's kind of relevant to a driver in BC. And BC offers a lot of advantages that um, other places do not, especially in terms of the charging infrastructure and and sort of incentives and things like that. So, um, you know, take Larry up on on any offer uh, to go talk to the various uh, EV drivers in the community. I agree. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining the webinar tonight. Um, like I said, I'll be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow afternoon and I hope you all have a great Thursday evening. Thanks. Bye.